Mm -hmm. I mean, I might decide, well, I'm just going to make tea bowls. And so that, that's, but, uh, but getting started, not having worked, uh, you know, I would quit making pots in November to go to this big show in Toronto, and then I wouldn't start again normally until spring, and so. Uh, but then you know, I came home, it was getting late in February, and I was flipping through this old, old sketchbook, and I saw this drawing, and I thought, I think I'll go out, I think I'll do something with kimonos. And I went out, and I started cutting off pieces of clay off the off the block of clay that I got, and then you can take a rolling pin or have a mill and a slab roller and and make big slabs of clay, but also you can throw clay, toss clay out on a flat surface, mm -hmm. and stretch it. And it will get wonderful surface on it. Mm. And so I began doing this with these things. And then I had some uh, copper pipes that I wrapped in paper, just put a piece around it, licked it to stick it on. So, that, And then I was hanging, and I had those stuck on a, on a framework of my wear cart. And, uh, I was just hanging these sheets of clay over that, and uh, and then uh, and then pushing them together, and then uh, and then maybe getting up behind them and and uh, and poking them out a little bit, and uh, then they had arms on these kimono-like pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, you had one shape, and then you had two more pieces for for the sleeves of the kimono. And, uh, oh, you could do all, they could fold the sleeve one, you could fold one sleeve over the clay, still very soft and wet. After you took it out, but you ha it had to be stiff enough so that you could take it off the copper pipe, uh, because, uh, but if you wanted to bend it, but it still had to be soft enough that you could bend that sleeve in. Hmm. I'll show you some slides of some of those. And, uh, and then I began mounting them on tees made out of first out of bamboo and then later out of copper, which are much easier on mounting them on blocks of wood. Mm -hmm. And that year I made 250 kimono sculptures ranging in size from a few at five or six inches plus their base to ones that were about, oh, 16, eight inches, 20 inches wide maybe. And uh, at the end of that first year, I had five left, mm. <laughs> and uh, I had a big show in out of the Mata Gallery in in Waterloo, Ontario, and I took uh, fifty of them to the one of a kind show in Toronto, which all sold. And people to this day ask me for them. Mm. I said, you don't make them anymore, though. No, I've tried a couple of times, okay. and it hasn't worked. So. When you start in on something like that and you don't like the result, do you just throw it out? I yeah, I just roll up the ball of clay and, okay. and, and you, make something else. Clay is a material that you can reuse in that way, is that right? Yeah, yeah. But it, uh, yeah. It doesn't, it's not expensive to scrap or anything like that. It's or you don't not, have to scrap it. it. Uh, it's not worth my, my uh, re... Uh, using my scrap and soaking it down and, uh, and then... Uh, drying it out again and then wedging it and everything. At that you're working for about 10 sets an hour. Okay. So it's it's just it's an inexpensive material relatively. It, uh, yeah, yeah, it still is. So so it's it's easy in clay to try something that doesn't work out. Yeah, it doesn't matter. You have a piece of wood, you wreck a piece of wood, you can't do much with it. And if it if it's still damp when I wreck it, you know, well then I just roll it up and wedge it into a ball, wedge the air out of it. Mm -hmm. I only throw away trimmings and things or things that have dried out. So uh, how many different ways do you think you try something before you like it? Do you, you try it hundreds of times if you're not shaping anymore. these kimonos? No, or, no, no. Oh, the kimonos? No, they just or, start, or anything. They just started coming out after a while. I was, uh, okay. I was, I was uh, in the studio, I don't know, uh, oh, I went in the, that year, I went in the studio and I made a crow sculpture first. Hmm. 
And then I started making these kimonos. And within days, they were working. I was really excited about them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can say made mm -hmm. 250 of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I also made that, then later on, made some, I called them dancing girls. And young. And uh, they, uh, yes, oh yes, they, they were just dresses and legs made out of rolled tubes of clay that maybe one was stuck in to stand it up and the other was bent and kicking out to the side and then it was kind of, you know, this whimsical, mm -hmm. they were like skinny cultish young girls with little short dresses and these long skinny legs and just a little hint of puberty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> coming on and they were a big hit. They grew out of the kimonos. I didn't mm -hmm. make many of them, I don't know, maybe maybe 20 or 30 of them. But What do you mean they grew out of the kimonos? Well, it was using the same kind of construction, these tossed, thrown slabs of clay. I see. <coughs> how, can, how, how do you tell when something is done? How do you know when it's done? You said something before about overworking. Well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I do that <coughs> sometimes, and I realize that I've done it, and I thought, holy God, so I smashed the whole thing. I mean, it either works, you know. If you're trying to save a pot, you've made a mistake, and you've thrown it off center, and you're still trying to save it, and it starts to collapse, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you're still trying to save it because you th it's not worth it, ever. So this is not a happy accident. This is an accident that's just not... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just a toss, a toss yeah. it out accident. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I can I laugh at those usually. And I had a I had a painting a watercolor painting instructor, the only one I ever had, uh, when I was at Penn State, and he said uh, all watercolor artists should hire a big dumb giant of a guy, and he stands behind you with a two by four, hunk a two by four. So when you're finished, when uh, when you're finished, he or you're finished when he whacks you over the head with this two by four. Because <laughs> you artists don't know enough to quit. I see. Now don't know when it's finished. Somebody else has to tell them. And it, I, I don't know that much about it, but I believe watercolors are less forgiving. They're, they are, yeah. yes, yeah. And the worst thing was, I mean, today I know many watercolors that paint over watercolors, paint over and paint over. Mm -hmm. I mean, you didn't do that. You had, you had your chance, one stroke, right? <laughs> when painting like, over watercolors, they show through, though, right? It's not like oh, oil. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. You yeah. can't hide anything. Yeah. And uh, badly worked over. I've seen some wonderful watercolors uh, <laughs> that have been worked and worked and worked over top very intentionally. I see. And quite nice. But uh, it, when you're doing your average landscape, you can't overpaint. Mm -hmm. And you can't even paint. There's some paint on top of one. Uh, uh, one color over another. His particular fear was painting over it after the first one has dried and then painting over it, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, uh, but yeah, this overworking of stuff. Um, I'm, I may be going back to something we've already talked about, but let me just be sure. Um, so when you finish a piece, you're off, how often are you in a place uh, how often do you end up where you thought you'd end up versus in a surprising place? Oh, I would say 90% of the time or, or better, I mean, I end up where I thought I would end up. Yeah, certainly at least 90% of the time. So by that you mean you, just, you <coughs> went in with a picture in your head of what this piece was going to be like, yeah. and in the end you've realized that? Yeah, yeah. Even when there are these accidents, which earlier sounded like surprises? Oh, yeah. well then, well... When you have an accident that you like, and what has, and you and you actually keep that piece, then you can no longer. You can't have the same accident again, mm -hmm. but you can you. Then hope that you can. Reproduce that sense of form uh, or that sense of surface that has happened again uh, not not exactly but can you make variations of that 
uh, acci uh, that accidental mm -hmm. uh, thing again uh, and just gain that sort of, just that little bit of control over it without the piece looking like you've forced it to look like that. Mm -hmm. So that they both, so that all three look spontaneous mm -hmm. and not... Uh, uh, but the second and the third in that set of three are in a sense less spontaneous? No, you hope, one? you hope okay. that they had, that they have the feel, the feel of spontaneity yep. that the original did. And sometimes they might, they might not, but they might have something else that might, mm -hmm. it may just part of that uh, spontaneous accident, a certain part of it may then become a part, that just one part of it may become a part of some totally different series of, of work. Mm -hmm. um, I never to intentionally try to reproduce the same thing exactly, so okay. therefore there are never two alike. Uh, and that's not just because of the limitations of the process and the material. Oh, it's you? very possible to make uh, okay. virtually identical duplicates, as close to mold cast ceramics as you want to get them just about. Mm -hmm. uh, because of this all way you can control every aspect of the work if you if you want to I will I will fuss about about a shape like this mm -hmm. as opposed to a shape like this I mean they're I, I think they're both quite nice and they're very they're very similar mm. but I'm but the proportions of height to width uh, the size of the base, the smallness of the base, and does it spring, how does it spring up from there? I'm very, um, very fussy about form. And I'd rather have, I'd rather have a pot that's a little too heavy, that has a beautiful form, than one that's, than one that's nice and light, and yet the form's not really very good, you know. I'll think about things and uh, think of shapes and things and uh, then I may make just the slightest little sketchy note so that I'll remember what I was thinking about last week that I would try doing or think about some new forms or something of that sort. <laughs> I'm very, very, very messy worker and only when it gets to the point where it's causing me difficulty working do I do any sort of straightening out. I don't have the biggest space in the world now to work here. Mm -hmm. But even if, if my studio was the size of my whole yard here, it would be just that much bigger a mess. Mm -hmm. I always have a radio going, but I have a radio going no matter where I am. And mm -hmm. I bought, I don't know how many radios I bought since I've been in Canada, but none of them seem to work in anything but the CBC. I don't mm -hmm. know why that is. Good ones, are, <laughs> you know, expensive ones or cheap ones. Are, <laughs> I listen to the CBC. Things happen with clay. Always unexpected things. Often, you can control clay, you know, precisely, but often things happen. Uh, so, and if they, if they happen accidentally, and I was often looking for the accidental things. I, I love accidental things, things that aren't too perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, too perfect is boring often. Mm -hmm.